Hi everyone, today we're going to present our capsule project, Automatic Proposal Competition, and it's sponsored by Zero Zero Robotics, and our advisor are uh, Chris and me. And so, so uh, Zero Zero Robotics already have this functionality of letting the user select how they want to frame their photo in terms of where they want to put the object or themselves into the photo, and then they can the draw the light <coughs> to the position automatically to take the shot. So the big motivation for our project is to further, further uh, improve that functionality. So as we all know, that drone has pretty flexible control. It can you know, do translational movement or do rotational. And uh, uh, consensus control of the drone is pretty hard. And even when you think you have a perfect shot, you know, some, sometimes some unexpected object may show up in the photo. And so we break the pro problem into two parts. So the first part, we call it auto framing. That is like we try to let the drone to learn where or how to fly to a position to take a pretty good initial shot. And then the second part we call, call it auto cropping. That's after the photo is taken, when the post process it, basically to make the photo uh, look better, has a better aesthetic quality. So I'm going to talk about the first part, auto framing. So to be more specific, auto framing refers to the problem of given an image with arbitrary size, when output a series of drone controls that can lead to an end state with a uh, photo of pretty high quality. So just like this diagram shows that if you start with some photo that's kind of pointing down, it's not, it doesn't look as great. So we hope the drone can learn kind of to tilt up a little bit until you have some, you know, like a third of the sky or something like that. So in the past, we kind of reviewed this paper called uh, Aesthetic of Where We're First Learning for Image Cropping. So even though it's an image cropping uh, paper, but the idea is kind of interesting. So uh, their entire point is to not using any drone truth uh, cropping box. And then they frame their problem as a sequential decision problem and as a week, also as a weekly supervised uh, learning method. So, uh, so their reward is uh, from a, like a pre-trained aesthetic assessment network, which is basically given an image, it can predict the quality score. And then they use the score as a reward and then train this uh, active credit network to, to train the RL agent to learn to move the, or like change the ratio of the, uh, of the carbon box. So like I said, the, the key idea for that paper is to use this aesthetic assessment network. But we thought like, it's a little bit more cute for the problem. Like if you have grown through this cropping block, it's not going to do any better uh, using the RL algorithm. But that's why we think like for our, in our case, it's a more appropriate application because the ground truth for like this kind of drone control is really hard. And also like the, uh, like the different drone control, like translational and rotational uh, action will end in more dramatic scene change compared to like the image cropping task where most of the pixels will remain the same while you move the cropping box. Uh, so uh, we just uh, start using the IRSIM simulator, which is an open source simulator for drones and cars. It's an uh, advantage of this simulator is it has pretty realistic virtual environments and dynamics, and with the Unity plugin, it has pretty high quality like 3D models of the terrains as well. And uh, so we tested two, basically two assessment assessment network, and we started with the view finding network that was using in the cropping paper. Uh, but we found that the, this performs pretty poorly in simulation, and it's probably because it's trained on a rather small data sets on real images. And then we switched to this uh, another assessment network called Neural Image Assessment from Google. And so, so, it's a, so this architecture is pretty simple. It's just a, a classification problem. And then we choose the backbone network as a mobile net uh, to feed our computational need on the drone. And this network is trained on the ABA dataset, which has uh, 250k images. And with no fine tuning, we found the network to work decently in the simulation. Uh, so here's an example. So here's the heat map. So the bottom left corner here is basically this image. And so each column from bottom to up, it's like I tilt the image 3 degree by 3 degree until you, it's like it's basically from negative 30 degree to 60 degree until you have whole sky. And then for each row, it's basically to rotate the drone uh, right by 3 degree per interval. And then you can kind of see the, uh, like the high score uh, it's like the yellow color has a higher score. That's kind of in the middle-ish, and the deep, like the pitch angle is around like zero. So that's like a third of the sky, mostly, which is pretty intuitive to like to to human. 
So here's another example. If you fix the yaw and only change the pitch angle from like negative 30 to 60, you can see the score kind of goes up first and then kind of goes down. So either too much ground or too much sky will end in lower score. And then we set up the MDP as the following. So for the state, we are using the RGB image for now, and we also include the, uh, the pitch and the yaw orientation of the drone. And then for action, uh, we're limiting to the rotational action first, just to begin with. And later on, we'll add the translational action. So for now, we basically uh, make the action discrete. So for uh, yaw and pitch, we have uh, plus, minus 3, 6, and 9. And also, we have the termination action, so in total 13 actions. And for reward, we're basically using the, the photo assessment network that we, uh, we took from the pre trained network. And then, so that's going to give me a score for each image. So for the reward, I'm using the consecutive frame, like the difference between the, the current frame reward and the previous frame reward, and the sign of that difference. That's the first term. And then, the second term is a penalty for too many time steps. So that's to prevent the drone from. Uh, moving forever. And for this count factor, I'm using 0.7. <coughs> and we're currently using the DQN as the, uh, like our main method. So the input for DQN is the image, RGB, and then the angle of pitch and yaw with the sine cosine transformation. And for convolutional layer, we took the same <coughs> weight, we took the pre trend weights from our photo assessment network. And then we can kind of together and with two flake vector layer. And the output are uh, 13 Q values with each value uh, corresponding to one action. And then the loss is just a standard uh, accumulating loss. So we did some proof of concept experiment in simulation. We basically fixed a drone at the X, Y, Z position and we assume perfect dynamics. And then we trained the agent to basically do a teach and yaw rotation for. Uh, like 100k steps, which is roughly like uh, 7,500 episodes. And then we did some benchmarking on different our algorithms. So these are all done in the OpenAI baseline. So we, I, I wrote a wrapper to convert the RCM environment to the OpenAI uh, GIMP environment. So here's a bit benchmark for uh, just for the 7,500 uh, 7, episodes. And you can see the DQN performs a lot better than all the other methods, but, if, but I only trend for not too many episodes, so this might change if I trend a lot more episodes. So PBO second place? Uh, yes, PBO one. Yeah. What's the difference between PBO one and PBO one? Uh, I think it's some minor tricks they did to stabilize it. But. So here's some result. So that's like the beginning with too much sky, and then that's like the end frame. So I was pausing on my laptop. So. And you can see kind of like sky with too much sky, and then so that's the last frame with like just like a third of the sky. And like here's another example. So that's like with too much ground in the beginning, and then it kind of learns to rotate up a little bit. So for the future timeline, by the end of September, I want to run more benchmarks on the R algorithm with more episodes and I guess more careful parameter tuning. I didn't really do any parameter tuning for now. And I also want to enable drone to adjust rotation at like any X, Y position, not just a fixed one. And then by the end of October, I want to add some translational movement to the action space. I also want to test uh, in multiple simulations since not just this one landscape, maybe some cityscape and other. Uh, environments. And by the end of November, I want to explore ways to improve the RL performance by maybe including some more <coughs> like current features or maybe some depth features. Uh, so that, or also like we might need to modify the set of network to work better in the simulation environment so that I can provide better reward. And in, by the end of December, we write about the project. Also, make it a little bit more clear what decent performance means for, for your goal. What, what does Okay, thank you. So uh, now let's look at the other problem part. So as mentioned by Wuning, our ultimate goal is to get a photo with a good composition 
and uh, uh, as for the auto auto framing, we get a good initial, and so we um, when the auto problem comes to play as a post processing procedure um, to improve uh, to further improve the aesthetic quality of the photo. Um, so the problem of auto cropping can be defined as given a photo with arbitrary size, we want to search for an optimal cropping box that achieves the highest aesthetic quality. So as mentioned many times in our present presentations, we mainly refer to two papers that are most associated to our project. Um, here is again a quick recap. So this paper is from SCCV 2017. Um, this work involves a three-step pipeline. So in the first step, they use a RPM to uh, predict an attention bonding box that indicates the most important contents. And it treats its attention box as an initial crop. And in the second step, around this initial crop, they generate a few cropping candidates with some predefined parameters. Finally, they, use the, uh, uh, they assess the aesthetic quality of all the cropping candidates and uh, of the classification network and output the one with the highest aesthetic score. And the second paper is from CVPR 2018. Um, so instead of organizing the bonding box regression and the aesthetic assessment in a cascading manner as in the formal paper, um, this work introduced a teacher-student framework. So the student model at the bottom um, basically predicts the, uh, uh, regress the, uh, predicts the uh, bonding box regression and at the same time predicts an aesthetic ranking over all the uh, predefined anchor boxes. Um, the bonding box regression part is, as usual, uh, supervised by the ground truth cropping box and the uh, backcrop losses associated to LOU. And uh, the aesthetics ranking part is supervised by the teacher model on the top, which uh, performs the aesthetic assessment and backcrop losses with the, um, associated with the aesthetics quality. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Both of these, are, what's the data for the uh, aesthetic? Uh, yeah, there are, like, uh, so, so as I will talk, talk about later, and so the money, um, so all of these papers, these two papers has one common thing, so apart from the bounding box regression, they have a separate assess, aesthetics assessment numbers, so they're actually between on two data set. So for the image cropping data set, they have an image as input and the uh, ground truth cropping box. And for the aesthetic assessment data set, they have some other images. And for one image, they have a score indicate um, like uh, how, ma uh, how much, the, uh, how, how, how good this, com uh, how good the composition of this photo. So there are actually two separate data set between the whole networks for those two things. Are you going to describe how the scores are obtained? Uh, the scores are are mainly like five levels, but uh, basically people train the aesthetics. Um, assessment network as a boundary classification network because when we train it using a, a, as a boundary classification network there would be a good balance between the positive samples and the negative samples. No, but I was asking you where did the ground to the state score come from? Did they solve these images to photography experts and ask um, uh, uh, Mostly about? the photo photo photography. Okay. Uh, like several photographers create um, photos. Okay. Okay, as, as, I see, one, as I said, one common thing of these two papers is that uh, apart from an uh, image uh, of one box regression networks, they all use the uh, aesthetics assessment network. So the assess, aesthetic assessment part is very essential because <coughs> the auto cropping task is not totally the same with the object detection task. Um, here is an example. So the green, bony, uh, the green boxes is the ground truth bonding box, and the red one and the yellow one are two predictions. So clearly the red one has a higher LU with the ground truth, but the yellow box is certainly more aesthetically pleasing. So instead of by cropping some LU, uh, some losses associated with LU, we also want to back crop some losses associated with the aesthetic quality. But the introduction of the um, assessment networks gives up some other problems. So for one thing, uh, as I said, we need a large amount of additional data and annotations of the aesthetic score to train the assessment network. And because basically those scores are, uh, are undertaken from the uh, photographer, it is kind of very expensive. And also more the, um, so the assessment networks is training on a completely different data set. So um, the assessment networks may not be that sensitive enough for the cropping task. 
So in our project, um, we are trying to explore a weekly supervised way to substitute the strongly supervised assessment network. And our basic idea here is to use the discriminator. So training in an adversary fashion, we expect the networks to explore itself which cropping is more similar to the ground shoes in the sense of aesthetics quality. Um, so we will look into some details of our architecture in a minute after I introduce our baseline model. Um, so we use the SSC networks as our baseline model. Um, it is pre-trained on Pascal VOC and then fine-tuned on the image cropping data set CPC. Uh, we tested our trained model on another image cropping data set, FCDB, which is a relatively smaller data set that is commonly used for evaluation. Um, here are some competitive results. So the VPN direct here um, is actually have a very much similar architecture with the SSD. Um, and it is also trained on the CPC data set, but with 40,000 more training data. So um, as you can see here, um, as expected, our baseline model performs comparative but a little bit low uh, accuracy than the VPN, uh, VPN direct model. Okay, now let's move to our architecture. So as I said, what we want to do is to substitute the aesthetic assessment network with the discriminator. So in general, the SSD takes an image and tries to regress the bounding box as similar to the ground truth as possible, while the discriminator takes the cropping and tries to distinguish whether it is the ground truth cropping or predicted cropping. So basically, this architecture works just like the uh, regular GANs. But as you may notice, a problem here, um, so for the scanner GAN, the direct output of the generator here is already an image. So when you combine the SSD, uh, the generator with the discriminator, the loss can naturally flow back. But here, our output of the SSD is actually some numbers of coordinates. So uh, when you simply stack the SSD with the discriminator, the loss is cannot practically flow back. Um, therefore, we employ a spatial transformer network proposed by Google DeepMind to solve this problem. Um, so basically, the STN is a differentiable module that applies a spatial transformation to a picture map. Um, so as for our architecture, the localization networks that um, provides the spatial transformation parameters is the SSD, and the output of the SSD is then converted to a frame transformation matrix with some extra calculation. And finally, with the grid generator and the differentiable sampler, we can get the uh, final croppings. Um, in this manner, when you stack two parts together and train combine, the losses can flow back. Um, so in response to some questions raised from our last presentation, we are using STN instead of some building cropped layer um, from PyTorch because instead of the losses uh, of the uh, image branch, actually we care more about the losses correctly back crops through this coordinate, coordinate branch. And by using a crop layer alone, as this based on my understanding, it is not possible to correctly flow losses associated uh, through this um, coordinate branch. And uh, also, as you notice, we um, fit in the cropping images directly to the discriminator <coughs> instead of uh, adapting some feature maps process the SSD and then use ROI pooling because um, actually the SSD and the discriminator are intended to be adversary. So we do not want this part, these two parts to share any uh, common convolutional layers. Um, here are some competitive results. Um, so as you can see, the performance of the discriminator architecture um, is actually a little bit higher than the baseline model, but the accuracy gain is actually not that significant. And here are some visualization results. Um, this, the first row shows some failure cases, and the second row shows some improvements of the uh, of, of our discriminator architecture. So mostly, you find that in the failure cases, the um, the blue boxes uh, as the predictions of the uh, discriminator architecture doesn't just flow anywhere; it tends to be closer to the red boxes which means that maybe in this case the discriminator does not work. So we uh, investigated in the reasons or why this is happening. 
So um, as I mentioned, since we are actually doing a cross data set evaluation, uh, we first look into the training data and the testing data to uh, sample, sample by sample to, to investigate if there are some problems here. And we noticed that there are some very obvious differences and biases between these two data sets. And in many of the bigger cases, the similar scenarios does not even show up in the training data set, so that would be a problem. And uh, based on my own observation, uh, because the training data set, CPC, is not really annotated by the photographers, so actually the quality of their annotations is not that high. And the second reason, sure, is maybe because of the architecture of the discriminator. Um, because for now, we are using the simplest architecture of the discriminator and the losses applied from the DC again. So, uh, but this task is actually more uh, difficult than the uh, uh, standard again task. So that, uh, we will try some of the ones architecture and losses in the next semester. Um, besides, we find another very interesting learning pattern of the baseline model and the uh, discriminator architecture is that, that it tends to uh, perform better when the, uh, the, the ground truth volume box has a higher, uh, is, uh, the area of the ground truth volume box is relatively large. So actually that's not a bad thing because with the auto framing, we have already got a good initial. So the uh, optimal cropping uh, within that good initial shouldn't be very small. We shouldn't like uh, crop too many, too many of the original images. So for the virtual timeline, we want to investigate both the data, data set and the architecture set. Uh, we will split, uh, split the CPC data set into the uh, training and validation set first and try to do the uh, validation using the CPC for debugging. And we will also contact the authors to see if we can have access to the uh, 40,000 additional images that they haven't been released yet. And by the end of October, we will try some of the ones architecture of the discriminator and the formulation of the losses. And uh, by the end of the uh, November, we will try to add in some SPP net to avoid the uh, resizing uh, to avoid the resizing problem before we fit into the fit in the input into our networks. And uh, by the end of the semester, we will work on the project. So that's all, all for our presentation. Thank you. Two questions from the faculty. Everybody is rustling already. So if we can all be frozen for just two questions and then we'll dismiss. Okay. All right. Do you plan to do any validation yourself using human staffing? Um, like uh, have your network be close and then have humans who can either be photography experts or Evaluation may not be at all correlated with the evaluation you get from a 
talk about in the end. So in the end, there is a question of which one is master. Does the one that appeals to the mass is master, or does the one that appeals to the photography agent? Even, even within the, like, the expert, there's going to be variation. Like, like, yeah, of course. But uh, uh, people think it's different. Yeah. That's why this class is pretty hard. Not all experts are the same. Yeah. But uh, it does not give you whether what the expert told you is evaluated the best in the setting. And that will also be what the mass is evaluated the best. And the mass is. The uh, feedback based on the mass may actually be much easier to acquire than the one based on photography experts. The photography experts are high, uh, expected to hire and they are the finest numbers, whereas the masses are massive and conceited. Okay, so I think we can like wrap up here.